Let's be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. 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 Worship. We're having fun in church. That's good. And we're going to the book of Mark today, chapter 1. So head that way. Uh, kiddos are going to Children's Church if they like to down the hall. But we're going to be in Mark chapter 1. And the rumors are true. We're starting a brand new sermon series today. And I'm preaching on something that uh, I think is going to be a little bit unique. Uh, I think this may be an area that there hasn't been a lot of preaching done on, or that I've heard anyway, because we're going to, we're going to study together the prayer life of Jesus himself. And so I've gone through the New Testament and I've highlighted every place I can find where Jesus was praying or where Jesus was teaching on prayer and have distilled that into about three or four messages we're going to have over the next few weeks. So today we'll, we'll get our feet in the water for sure in Mark chapter 1, looking at the prayer life of Jesus. And I'm glad to be here. And I'm so glad to see all of you here too. Amen. So, welcome to our visitors. Mark chapter 1, verse 32 is where we will begin, going down to verse 39. Take a look with me. Mark 1, 32 says, That evening at sundown, it says, they brought, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by the devil. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Now, can, can you picture that in your mind? The whole city came and was gathered there at the doorway where Jesus was, and they were bringing him sick people and possessed people and who knows what all, and it says the whole, whole city was there. Verse 34, now this is the good part, it says that he healed many who were sick with various diseases, and he cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Amen <laughs> to that. And it says, now, rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed, and he went out to a desolate or solitary or, or lonely place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. Let's stop right here and have a word of prayer. We will go forth into the message just now. Thank you, Father, this morning that with every place we could be in the wide world, we're here in your house today. And I want to pray that your blessings, Father, would fall on everybody who is here. And Lord, as we look into your holy word, I just want to pray, Father, that your spirit would, would guide our hearts to be very open, uh, very teachable today, Father. I, I just pray that we might drop everything that's bothered us during the week. We can get, us, get rid of pride or anything that might come between us, Lord, and what you have to say. I just want to pray that it may be removed so that we can fully comprehend your word and be blessed and encouraged this morning. So, Father, I just want to pray that you would guide us in all things and use me this morning, Lord, to preach. I want to be hidden behind your cross, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So you see Jesus kind of getting away from everybody and going out on his own to pray here. And, you know, they called Jesus Master. Right? Have you ever seen in the scriptures where somebody would call Jesus Master? Yes. That's one of my favorite titles for him. Because Jesus is called a whole lot of things, but, but Master to me, uh, you know, someone who is a master is someone who knows how something is done and is skilled at it. Right? I have a great friend back in Oklahoma who is a master farrier. He's a horseshoer, and he's a master at it. He's got that title, and he shoes horses, and and that title he has, Master, is not just a title. He is a master of that trade. He knows just about everything there is in that process. And it doesn't matter what a horse has been into or the, the condition of its hooves or any variable. You know, how long it's been since he's been shooed, uh, my friend can, can get it done. He can expertly shoe that horse because he's a master at that trade. And I think that to call Jesus Master is to acknowledge his lordship. It, it's to say, you're above me and I want to follow you. You're my master, sure. But it also shows us that he has mastery over all that he does. And elsewhere in the scripture, they said, well, Jesus does all things well, right? That he is the master of what we, of what we need to know. And I'll tell you one thing Jesus was definitely master of, and that is prayer. 
He's a master of prayer. And I wanted to start by saying that it's interesting to me that Jesus prayed. Because we know that Jesus was God in the flesh, right? That he was God incarnate. So that might bring up the question in your mind that if he and the Father are one, well then why would he need to pray, right? Wouldn't he just know the heart of God automatically? Wouldn't he just need to, to think it and it would be done? Why would he have to pray? And I'll say that for one thing, when Jesus came to earth and was born in the flesh, he, he set aside some of his almighty power to live as we live. To live as we live. And in doing so, he wanted to model for us the type of life that ought to be lived. So during that time, he operated as a person who's in a real body and is full of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus, during his earthly ministry, played by our rules, so to speak, to show us how a person ought to live as a believer. And so we call him master and we say, well, you're the master of life. You know how to live perfectly, Lord. You know how to pray perfectly. You know how to lead people perfectly. You see what I'm getting at? He knows everything about how it ought to be done in human existence, and he is our model, church. He is our model in every way. So I want you to take him as your model of prayer this morning. Acknowledge that he is master. Acknowledge that he knows how a person ought to pray, and follow him in that. So he's going to model for us, and we will examine very closely the prayer habits of the Lord himself. So I hope you're ready for a study that I, I think is going to bless you and might open up some new things that you haven't looked into before. And there is much that we don't know, as the Bible doesn't record every single time Jesus ever prayed. All right, So we won't see his entire prayer life, but like these verses in Mark 1 that we're looking at, the Bible does show us several occasions where Jesus would go spend time with his Father. And they're absolutely beautiful. I like to imagine Jesus getting up before everybody else and going out into the night while it was still dark and spending time with the Lord and being in that communion with his Father. And over the next few weeks, we're going to look at that, but we're also going to look at the Lord's Prayer. See, I grew up, when I would, when I would go to church, I grew up reciting the Lord's Prayer over and over and over again. And nobody ever taught me, nobody, you know, nobody ever said, hey, these are areas of life that you ought to be praying for. And maybe you shouldn't say these exact words just to be repeating them, but to use this to see how we ought to pray. So we'll look at the Lord's Prayer together. We'll take a look at it next week, as a matter of fact. We will look at Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know the one. Father, may this cup pass from my lips. Nevertheless, your will be done and not mine. And it says he prayed so hard that blood came out of his forehead like sweat. That type of intensity, that type of concentration. So we'll look at that. That's going to challenge us, no doubt. And we will also look at the fact that Jesus is still praying today. How many of you know that's the truth? He's interceding for us right now. So his ministry of prayer has not ended. And we'll look at that too. But I want you to see the very first thing today. I want you to notice here, before we see anything else, that Jesus was busy. Are you busy? Yes. <laughs> I know you. I know your lives. I know how busy the folks in this church are and how many things you've got going on. We happen to be a church with a lot of very busy people. Busy with work, busy with activities with our kids, busy with church life. We've got a lot going on, right? Jesus knew what it was to be busy. It wasn't long after he started his earthly ministry and started doing some miracles and started healing some people that his fame started to really grow through the whole region. So guess what happened? Everybody came to him wanting something from him, and kept him busy probably from sun up to sundown. Everybody seemed to want something or need something from him. So if you put yourself in the shoes of Jesus for a minute, you will recognize very quickly that he was giving and giving and giving and giving. 
Sound familiar? You ever feel like people have taken so much from you that you're drained? Y'all know that feeling, don't you? That's what it is to be a human being and be an adult in this world today, isn't it? It's to know what it is to feel truly drained by the demands of life. Whether it's your job that's constantly hounding you and needing more and more from you, and here they are wanting this and that, and you can't get a moment's peace, or whether it's having young children in the home, or whether it's your your classes that you're in and you're taking and you got all that homework or whether you're busy in church or whatever, Christ certainly knows what it is for people to want and want and want and want and want and keep on wanting because they kept coming to him needing, 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 needing. And so I'm certain he knew what it was to feel emotionally and physically drained. I know it's a little weird sometimes to think about Jesus' humanity, but you got to understand that being a real person in human flesh, even though he was the Son of God, that this flesh gets tired. There were times, I bet, when Jesus was dragging around because of all the need that people had around him. But he met their needs. He did. Look at verse 33. Or verse 32. It says, that evening at sundown they brought to him. Notice that it was at sundown, right? So he's working the late shift. <laughs> he's been called in for extra hours I know you can relate to this boy some of you have worked 80 90 hours a week you know what that feels or 80 90 hours in two days or some of you got more hours in your work than there is in, in actual time but it says they were that evening and sundown here they came all right so they're bringing the sick they're bringing those who were demon possessed right and verse 33 says the whole city the whole city gathered at his door. Can you imagine what that need must have looked like? To look out on that mass of people. And he loved them. He loved them, church, as he loves you today. And so he met those needs. He met those needs. And I bet it was ours. I bet this went on into the, into the dark. You know, this, there wasn't any quitting time for the Lord Jesus. The, the demand was too great. So he met their needs, but then you know what he did? Do you notice what, what transpired after all of this, all of people wanting something from him? And in verse 35, it says that he rose very early in the morning while it was still dark, and he departed, and he went out to a lonely spot, and there he prayed. He had to get some time alone with the Father. And so he went. And when we are too busy, church, when we feel drained, when you have those times when you're bone tired and the need keeps on coming and you wonder, how will I hold up to all the things the world is demanding of me right now when life is drawing too much out of us, we need to take a cue from the Master and withdraw there is a time when you simply have to take a step out and recharge. And folks, if that wasn't a holy and good thing to do, Jesus wouldn't have been doing it. Amen to that? Because he does all things good, right? And never sinned even once. So he wasn't being lazy by getting away. Far from it. It was at that point feeling his most drained that he said, I've got to go someplace where I can have communication with my father and I can rest in him and get some restoration inside. When life is drawing too much from us, we got to learn to withdraw. Withdraw where? Where we go? Well, that's up to you. That's up to you. Now see, to Jesus, it was very often a desolate or solitary or lonely place. He'd go out in the wilderness you know, he'd go out into what people would consider to be the badlands and get away from everybody. Sometimes he would go to the top of the mountain. So he had his places where he liked to withdraw, but wherever he was able to go and nobody be with him, that was, that was the spot where he wanted to go and pray. And folks, I want to encourage you right here to spend solitary time with God. Every day, have some time where you are alone with the Father. If you're a Christian, you need it. I mean, if Jesus had to do that, how much more do we have to do that, right? If they drained him, he said, I gotta get away. 
How much more do we need to pause in life and practice maybe getting away? And I know sometimes the demands, the emails, the text, you know, they, they'll find you. I mean, they came and found Jesus too, right? <laughs> it says Peter got to looking for him and went up there and found, oh, everybody's looking for you, Lord, and intruded in on him. But there were some hours there that Jesus had to be with his Father. And I want to encourage you to spend solitary, quiet time with the Lord every day of your life. And if, you know, even if, and especially if, you feel like you're too busy to breathe, get some time with God. It'll make all the difference in your life. Take a cue from the Master. And that's the time that we most need to carve out some time, some moments that are just between us and God, and be alone with Him. And folks, if you do not regularly have a quiet time where you're connected to God and you know, you have a point in every day where you meet with the Lord to talk with Him. I want to strongly urge you as pastor to do so. I truly think that it will grow you as a person and as a Christian more than you even know is possible. Because if Jesus was out there doing it, I want to do it too. That needs to be my habit. If it was His habit, He's showing me how to live. And folks, sometimes you just got to take, take time out. Why? Begs the question, why? God will strengthen, recharge, and re-energize us spiritually, and he will help us to refocus. Amen. Now, if you have not experienced this, I challenge you to try that. This week will demand a lot from you. And I want you to think back to these verses and say, I'm going to get away. You know what? I'm going to take an hour right here. I'm going to go somewhere. And I told you a minute ago, Jesus' place was the wilderness or in the mountaintop. Find a holy spot where you feel like you can really commune with the Lord. That might be out at your pond. You know what I'm saying? That might be out at your deer stand. Woo. I just got excited. It's almost deer stand. <laughs> I, I've communed with God pretty close to the deer stand before. Or fishing, right? Or even whatever, whatever the place is for you. Maybe it's your porch swing. Maybe it's your favorite chair. I told Dale yesterday, the lawnmower can be a holy place. Yeah. You're just brain dead, cruising along, right? Can't hear anything, can't say anything, talk to God, right? You can really commune with the Lord on the lawnmower sometimes. It really doesn't matter where, as long as you do it, as long as you spend time with the Lord. He will help you. He will get you ready for whatever fight you face this week or the next day. The world is going to always compete for your attention. And it's going, to, it's going to seem like the last thing you ought to do is withdraw and spend time with the Lord. You'll think, I'm too busy for this. I can't carve out this time. And certainly, I would say that your enemy, the devil, would like that very much if you stayed so busy and run yourself so ragged that you have a hard time being a Christian. It's not what God wants for you. God will refresh you. Your spirits, brethren. He will. He'll encourage and lift you up every day. You got to get in this word. You got to have a prayer life. And so it's an act of obedience to spend quiet time with God. But it's also an act of faith when you set everything down and say, I must tell my father. I got to spend time with him right now. Now I want you to leave your finger there in Mark 1 and turn to the same book, Mark chapter 6. Just a few, few chapters over. Go to Mark chapter 6 with me. Can I show you this principle further? I'll show you a little bit more about this. Mark 6, verse 30. Now you, some of you are going to be able to, you're going to relate to this instantly. Mark 6, 30. We'll go back to 1 in a minute, but we're 6.30. It says, the apostles returned to Jesus. See, they've been out doing ministry. They've been out preaching and teaching and healing and all that stuff. It says, they returned to Jesus, and they told him all that they had done and taught. So they came and reported in. And we don't know what their report was. Maybe it was... Hey, Lord, we did really well, and everything went great, and we're excited. Or it may have been, wow, we had trouble today, this was difficult. But they came in, and they reported into the Lord and his response to all this busyness. Look what he said, verse 31. And he said to them, 
come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. That was his response, not, all right, boys, that's good, so get right back out there and keep going because there's so much ministry we can't stop. I want you to run yourself half to death for the kingdom. No. They came in and said, boy, we've been busy, Lord. And he said, great, now. Now what we want to do is come away. I, I, folks, Jesus says the same thing to you today. Come away with me. Yeah. Come to a desolate place, right? And rest a while. And it says, for many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. Can you relate to that? You ever been so busy? Lunch wasn't even in plans. Too busy to even stop and think? Folks, that's the modern world, isn't it? But that was also the ancient world. They were busy then too. Maybe we're busier, but I believe the Lord's response is the same today. Come away with me. See what I'm saying? Come away with me to a desolate place. Let's rest a minute. And he knew that they'd been coming and going and, and had no leisure even to eat. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> Amen. And Jesus wanted them to come away. And really, doesn't that sound so good? A little rest in the Lord? I like to rest in some of you, but rest in the Lord is even better. Because you can rest your body and be comfortable, but you can also have find rest for the inside of you, for the troubled mind, for the restless heart. You get those things healed by spending time with the Lord. I would dare say that some of you desperately need that. You needed to hear this this morning. You needed to hear God actually encouraging you to stop and withdraw and rest a little bit. And don't kick yourself because you're not doing more. The world will always demand more from you. But God wants to give you more. He wants to recharge you. He wants to invest in you. He wants to pour his spirit into you and lift you up. And some of you really, really need it. And I want to encourage you to go get it. Get some rest, church. Your pastor authorizes it. <laughs> You're approved and cleared for neck this afternoon. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're enthusiastic about our nap. <laughs> and it's all right to have one. Somebody else will try to convince you. Now, you shouldn't be learning real well. Forget it. Spend time with the Lord. Withdraw, right? Can you imagine a little retreat with Jesus? What that must have been like for them? He said, come away with me. We'll go up to a lonely place. I bet they ate together, prayed, worshipped, probably laughed. You know, we, we often see these paintings of what people think Jesus must have looked like. And, and he either looks sad or somber. Or, but, I, but I like the ones where Christ has a smile and a little laughter. Because I know that must have been a good time up there for them. Come away with me. Let me give you some rest, he says. And folks, I want you to have that too. Restoration of the soul. God does not want you to run yourself so ragged that you can't function. There's a time to rest. Who says so? The master. The master says so. Amen. Now back to chapter one. Go back to chapter one. Let me show you something you might not like. Verse 35. We got to deal with this very early thing. Let me straighten my tie. And get ready to tell you in verse 35 that Jesus' habit was to get up very early in the morning while it was still dark and go do this. Probably because he had to. Right? That was going to be the only hours where nobody was going to be bothering him for something. And I say bother, maybe that's a poor choice of words. I don't mean to give you the impression that Jesus didn't want to help people. But I mean that would be the only time somebody wouldn't be after him for something. You know, so he sacrificed to sleep, and I'm bad at this. I'm bad at this. I am not an early riser. I know some folks who get up before the chickens, and it's easy for them. That's not my custom. I'm more of a night owl. I can stay up very, very late. So Jesus' <laughs> practice was to go early in the morning, but I think just about any time. 
I think it would. I think any time you spend with the Lord is the right time to spend with the Lord. But if you've got to cut out some sleep, <laughs> you're following the master, right? That's what he had to do. Jesus made that sacrifice because the demand was so great. How much energy, how much intensity, how much thought did it take to heal all those people and to cast out those spirits? That would wear me and you out to even do that once. And he did it all day long so we can imagine it took a lot of energy. And Jesus went and took time for refreshment. But you notice that in his mind, the refreshment of prayer was more important than the refreshment of sleep. That's where we'll feel challenged right there by the master. Is to understand that he's ahead of us in these things. And better at it than us. But we're going to learn from him. We're going to learn from him. The desolate place was what he saw. The lonely spot. The solitary place. And he did it even in the middle of the night. And like I said earlier, you can do that just about anywhere that it's just you and God. And when you're there, you do what Jesus did. You just spend time with the Father. Try to find that place and then go. And when and where is up to you. You see what Christ did. But when and where is up to you, there's no wrong time or wrong place to seek God. Seek Him anytime and anywhere and you are doing the right thing. Amen. There's never a wrong time to be a person of prayer. Right. There's never a bad time to read that Bible of yours. It's never wrong. Never in a million years. So you have to look to what the Master did and know that He got away from everyone and that's really the key. So I want to urge you to try to make a special time every day where you read your Bible, Read a page in your devotional, if you got one. Read your Sunday school lesson or, or whatever edifies you in the Word of God. But don't neglect to actually spend time praying and talking to the Lord. Do you talk to God in the average day? I hope you do. I hope you do. I do. I talk to God a lot. How do you do it? How do you talk to God? Well, it's all about having friendship with the Lord. I encourage everyone, and I'll encourage you right now, to talk to God like he's right there with you, because he is. Amen. Now think about it. Talk to God like he is right there with you, because he is. Yes. God is everywhere, right? Yes. So, so it isn't that you have to somehow have a special power in you that can... Ah, I gotta, I gotta send this message across the uh, outer space. God is so far out there. I'm, it's gonna be hard to get a message. No, no, no. It's never hard to get a message to the Lord. Because He's close to you as the air you're breathing right now. Oh, yeah. And if you're in that quiet place, man, you might be listening and, and you're talking to God, and you might actually hear Him speak in your ear. Maybe not like a you know, big booming voice from heaven, but in the still small voice. Yeah, the Father will communicate with you. And I know some of you desperately have been wanting that. I want God to speak to me. I want to hear his voice. The scripture says that we can. We can. But we've got to get in the habit of spending time with God like he's right there because he is. And I also tell people, talk to God like he's your best friend. Because he is. <laughs> right? Not only is he right there with you, but you have no friend better and closer to you than the Lord himself. Amen. And you ought to be able to tell a friend that close just about anything that's been roaming through your head. Yep. I know sometimes we feel like we've got to put on airs before God and act holy. I think that's a good impulse because he's the God of the universe, right? And we don't want to be we don't want to be slothful or, you know, uh, sarcastic with God or something like that. So we worry about, oh, well, I need to straighten up and pray here. But, folks, when it comes to telling God what's going on in your life, don't you know that God already knows what's going on in your life? God already knows what you've been thinking. God already knows what you've been struggling with. So let's not be afraid to take it all to him and say, Father, I've had an awful day. You ever do that? I mean, I know. We want to go to God and say, Lord, thank you for this day. It's been wonderful. But sometimes the day hasn't been wonderful. 
Sometimes the day will kick you around and you'll barely come sliding into the finish line at night. <laughs> and you'll think, boy, what a day. And that's your moment. That's your moment to engage your very best friend. And go to him and say, Father, I am struggling. This has been hard and I don't understand it. And I'm, I've been wondering where you are. And I've been, I've been wondering what I ought to do and it's okay to come before God and be real. Amen. And I want to challenge you to do it. Now, if you doubt me, go read the Psalms. You want to see somebody getting real before God? David did it. He would come in there and say, Lord, you are far from my cries. I feel removed from you. Like I'm about to slide into the pit. Hurry and rescue me, God. That's, that, I, I always find that funny when I... I see David say, answer me quickly, Lord. So I think, yeah, that's me too. <laughs> I know what that feels like. Dear Lord, give me what I want. Give it to me today. <laughs> but he wasn't afraid to be real before, the God, before God. And remember, God already knows. God already knows. So you can share anything with him. And you don't have to use fancy, churchy-sounding language when you pray. Just be natural. Yeah. Now, I, I, I like to hear a good King James prayer every now and then. <laughs> right? Oh, Father, we thank thee that in thy mercy, you know, oh, it's sound. I mean, that's a good formal sounding prayer that you, you know, you pray in church when everybody's kind of praying. But, man, when it's you, when it's just you, just be real before God. No need to have pretense whatsoever. Just tell him how it's been. Tell him how it's been. You don't have to act super righteous. Just be real. And that's how Jesus received the strength to continue the mission that he was on is he would go in the middle of the night, if that's what it took, and he would take all of his thoughts and all of his needs and all of his emotions because he had those too. He was human, remember? His emotions and everything, take them straight to the Father. He says, i got to get away. i got to get away and be before God. Now, if you're like me, sometimes when you sin, you think, well, I'm going to kind of duck and dodge and I'm going to avoid God for a little bit because he don't want to talk to me right now. He knows what I've been up to. Folks, come on. Does the Bible not show us time and time again that God loves us? Amen. And that he loves us despite our ugliness. He loves us despite our sinfulness. He wants to be with you. I'm not much of a feel-good, tickle-your-ears kind of preacher. But I'm here to tell you that he wouldn't have sent his son to the cross if he didn't want you. Amen. If you weren't worth it, he wouldn't have done it. You have worth before God. Amen. He did all that to have fellowship with us, you know. In the Garden of Eden, we were supposed to just walk and talk with him forever. Sin messed that up. But then here comes Christ, right? To redeem us and bring us back into the fold. So why don't we spend more time with God? I know sometimes when the preacher says, hey, we're going we're gonna to have a prayer meeting or we're going to have a prayer ministry, it sounds like work. And it is to an extent, but it's also a joy. Because to spend time with God is always going to benefit you. It's going to bless your life, church. So that's also what we must do, what the master did. Don't hide from God when you pray. If you had an awful day, tell him. If you had a victorious day, tell him. <laughs> if you're just not feeling it, tell him. But don't neglect to spend time with God. Amen. Every day. Every day. So we have many great things coming up to look forward to in this study as we continue to look at what Jesus was doing in his prayer life. And there'll be more tonight. So I invite you to come back and get the other pieces of what we're, of what we're doing here and over time, you're going to begin to see, hey, this is how Jesus prayed. That's how I want to be praying as well. Yeah. Let's close with this song.